Come with me to Egypt. You could buy these if you had plenty of money and hang them in your mansion in Turak and they'd look fantastic. And many people do. Priceless Egyptian art. What do these have in common? They all have the sun disks. What do these have in common? They all have sun disks. This is Ra, the Egyptian sun god. And what do these have in common? Now if you were an Israelite trapped in Egyptian bondage and paganism and exposed to this pagan religious worship, wouldn't it sort of rub off on you? You're there for, well you're certainly there for your lifetime, but the Jewish people have been trapped in Egyptian bondage for over 400 years. That's at least five generations, if not six, building monuments for the Egyptians. Slave labour, you've seen the movies, the Ten Commandments and so forth. Making mud bricks with straw and carting them up terrible inclines for the glory of Egypt. They would have been exposed to this kind of worship. It was all around them. So am I correct in assuming that the Israelites in Egypt, some of this would have rubbed off? Would some of it have rubbed off? I'll put it to you that it did. Please turn with me to page 119 of your Bibles, Exodus chapter 32. <clears throat> this is a familiar scene. Moses is on Mount Sinai. He's been away for a while. The people are getting restless. And they make a golden calf. Verse 4. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a moulded calf. Then they said, this is your God, small g, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day offering burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. When did they rise? Verse 9. When? Verse 6. When did they rise? They rose early. Did they rise at midnight? Did they, uh, did they get up uh, in the early evening? They rose early on the next day. I put it to you that they were rising early to worship the sun. I can't prove it to you. It's pure gut feel with a supporting text we're going to look at in a moment. They, were, they would have fashioned an idol based on their memory of their long captivity in Egypt. They wouldn't have made an idol in a form that God would have approved of. It would have been based on Egyptian design. Am I right? Because they'd been there 430 years. Come with me to Joshua chapter 24, page 327. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river, and where? Put away the gods which your father served in Egypt. There's your evidence. If you tie the two together, there was Egyptian influence in the idolatrous false gods that the Israelites reverted to from time to time. And here are these animals, Arpus the bull with the sun disc. And I put it to you based on these two verses alone, that there's a strong case that the Israelites were inadvertently worshipping an idol with a connection to Egyptian sun worship. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4 please, page 247.
You know, in the four o'clock meeting we had over a hundred people, Peter, didn't we, I believe? Here today, and uh, it's a small church, so a hundred people is a lot of people. And I thought, being such a beautiful day, that no one would turn up. Verse 19. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. Take heed lest you worship the sun. The Bible outlaws sun worship, period. Turn please to 2 Kings chapter 23, page 538. Those of you who know the story of Manasseh, a king of, e of Israel, how he polluted the land, how he introduced idolatry and Asherah poles in the high places and made sons pass through the fire, how he shut down the sanctuary. He did more damage to the sanctuary of Israel than Antiochus Epiphanes did because he went on and on with it for nearly 50 years. Antiochus Epiphanes did it for about three years and a bit. Manasseh was a bad guy. But he repented and God accepted his repentance. He is the prodigal son of the Old Testament. Now Josiah comes along and he reforms the place. He cleans up the place and he says in verse 5, Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal and to who? Sun. To the sun. Those who had burned incense to the sun. Get rid of it. Come across to the next page on the right, verse 11. Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to what? To the sun. Sun worship was prolific. In these Old Testament times, they were not ordained of God. They were a product of paganism. Now for the killer verses of Scripture. The, most, the strongest language about sun worship that you'll find in all of the Bible, Ezekiel chapter 8, page 1126. Ezekiel is taken on an abomination excursion. God takes him in vision. The Holy Spirit takes him in vision and takes him to Jerusalem in vision. And God says, I'm going to show you one abomination after another and every one that I show you gets worse as I introduce them to you. And he says in chapter 6 of verse 8, <clears throat> Furthermore, <clears throat> He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again. You will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing here. So I went in and saw... And there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. Okay? This is an abomination excursion. Ezekiel's been shown one abomination. He goes, shock, horror. And God says, you think that's bad? Have a look at this. And he shows Ezekiel something else. And Ezekiel goes, and God says, now I'm going to show you something really bad. And it is found in verse 15. <clears throat> then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they were worshipping the sun. 
As far as the Bible is concerned, as far as God is concerned, sun worship is the abomination of abominations. I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write Ezekiel chapter 8. It is the worst case scenario of an abomination. Let's explore the connection between sun worship and the origin of Sunday and how it crept into the Christian church. <clears throat> Come with me to Rome. <clears throat> the year is about 200 AD. This is a symbol of the sun, sunburst. They're worshipping the sun. This is Mithra, the sun god of, of Persia, a mixture of Persia and India. Here is a sunburst. Here is a garland of sun rays and so on. <clears throat> sun worship in Rome was as popular as Tad's Lotto is to Victoria. It was extremely popular. And when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. And worshipping the sun was part of the normal daily routine in Rome. And because the sun god was so immensely popular, look at that, that looks like the Statue of Liberty. Sun rays. Sun rays. Because of the popularity of the sun god, the first day of the Roman week was named in its honour. Sun day. Deus solus. Day of the sun. Look it up on the internet, look it up in your encyclopedia, look up under sun worship. There is tons of material there. And the Romans named the days of the week after the planets and the sun. The first day sun, second day moon and so on, and Saturday the seventh day after Saturn. And anyone in Rome who was converted to Christianity would have come from a pagan background. They wouldn't have come from a Jewish background. They would have come from a pagan background. They would have come from a sun-worshipping background or something associated with it. And their conversion to Christianity probably would have been genuine, but they had pagan roots, these people. Why did they abandon the Sabbath, these Gentile Christians in Rome? Why did they dump the Sabbath, these Gentile Christians in Rome, with a pagan background? And why did they adopt Sunday? First reason, they wanted to look separate from the Jews. The Jews were not popular in Rome. The Jews had given the Roman authorities a lot of trouble. There was always an uprising. There was always a rebellion against Rome. You know this. The Jews were a thorn in the flesh to Rome. Palestine was a problematic part of the Roman Empire. And anyone who converts to Christianity really did not want to be identified with the Jews, particularly in Rome. They would rather identify with the Romans. Why? Because at this time, Sabbath keeping was prohibited by Roman law. The Roman government introduced harsh measures against the Jewish people monetary measures, political measures, religious measures and military measures. Roman writers and authors reviled Jews for their Sabbath keeping. They said one seventh of their life they're wasting in idleness. Wasting their life away. One seventh lying around eating when they should be working. And these authors like Seneca and Perseus and Tacitus and Plutarch, please note the dates, very clearly write about the anti-Jewish feelings in their communities, as did the early church fathers. Ignatius and the Epistle of Barnabas and Justin Martyr. Look at the dates. Look at the dates. Fairly close to the cross still. Crucifixion was around 31 AD. It's not long after the cross that this strong anti-Jewish feeling is prevalent in the Roman Empire, particularly in Rome. And these conditions encouraged the adoption 
of Sunday worship to look separate from Jews. And the Sabbath was reduced to a supposedly Jewish symbol. Don't we do this today? Don't we do today exactly what the Romans did then? Don't we say, well, the Muslims, their day is Friday. And the Roman Catholics, their day is Sunday. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, well, they are Sabbath keepers. But let me put it to you, there, there are 501 other churches who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church is just one of them. I would rather have Jesus' face there. And so by a day, we immediately identify a religious group. Am I right or wrong? And the Romans did exactly this. So if you didn't want to be, be Jewish or look Jewish or even have anything to do with Jews in Rome, you wouldn't be keeping the Sabbath. You'd be keeping the Sunday. Let's just go back a few years, shall we, to the first Jewish rebellion against Rome in 66 AD and the Romans destroyed Rome, uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is history. And after Jerusalem was destroyed, the Bishop of Rome gained full leadership of all the Christian churches. The Roman authorities gave them the power because they were not keeping the Sabbath. They had not identified with Jews who had given the Romans such a headache. The Bishop of Rome was in a perfect position to get political support from the Roman authorities. Please note it's not the Bishop of Antioch, it's not the Bishop of Alexandria, it's the Bishops of Rome that got the power. Then there was another Jewish revolt. How many revolts do you need? Jewish people did not want to be under the Roman yoke. They revolted again. It's called the Bar Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba revolt. 132 to 135 AD, it lasted for three years. Thousands of people died. Lots of bloodshed. Lots of horror stories. And Emperor Hadrian comes in hard on the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And he defeats them. Thousands are killed. Thousands are taken back to Rome as slaves. Thousands were crucified. It's a terrible story. He was the Adolf Hitler of that era. And he issued law that was anti-Jewish and anti-Sabbath. Why? Because he saw the Jewish religion as the cause of their rebellion. If he could come down hard on their religion and legislate against it, then the major driver of all these uprisings would be controlled. Do you see that? Please take note of the year 135 AD. By worshipping on the popular day of the sun in Rome, Gentile Christians without a Jewish background but with a pagan background showed separation from the Jews and identification with the Romans. Do you see that? This happened only in the Roman churches where most of the converts were Gentiles. Why? Well, we've just gone through this. To be separate from the Jews, to identify with the Romans, at a time when the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath was prohibited by law. To keep them down so they wouldn't rebel again. The Roman churches were designed to face towards sunrise. Facing towards sunrise became the orient orientation for prayer. The Jerusalem church, however, led by the apostles, a mixture of Jewish and Gentile converts, stayed true to the Bible Sabbath. And I've got documents from the Vatican to prove it. Acts chapters 1 right through to 15 gives you the outline of the Jerusalem church, the city in which Jesus died and in which he rose again. But these people, 
the Jerusalem church were loyal to the Seventh-day Sabbath, and I'll prove it to you. But in Rome, mainly Gentile converts with pagan backgrounds, they stayed with the Sunday because of their sun worship backgrounds. And Paul says in Romans 11.13, I'm writing to you Gentiles. The book of Romans is Paul's letter to the Romans. Here we have it, Church of Rome, Jerusalem Church, sun worship. Join the Romans. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. In Jerusalem, the pure church. Mixture of Gentiles and Jews. What is this? It's worth probably millions of dollars. It's a Roman artifact. There's that sunburst again. And the inscription is Sol Invictus which means unconquered son. Here's Constantine the emperor. Here are his coins with his face. On the back of the coin we have the inscription Sol Invictus, the unconquered son. Here is a silver disc in the British Museum. Sol Invictus, the rays of the sun. Here is the Emperor Constantine issuing the first Sunday law in history. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all the workshops be closed. Emperor Constantine, 7th of March, 321 AD, there's the reference. Please note the year, 321 AD, first Sunday law in history, forcing people to stop working on Sunday. He had been converted to Christianity. It was a very nominal conversion. I don't think a lot of Bible study came into it. It was for political expediency and other reasons. But it wasn't a strong conversion to Christianity. Then Pope Sylvester comes along and he introduces a mechanism that will push Christians to keep Sunday holy. He thought, well, the Jewish people are feasting on Sabbath. <clears throat> I'm going to issue a decree to get people to fast on Sabbath. They will look so sad and miserable. They will look so hungry and desperate that they'll be desperate for Sunday breakfast. And they will look completely different to Jews who are feasting. But the real Christian is fasting. And so you can tell immediately the difference between a hungry Christian and a well-fed Jew. This is Pope Sylvester. A decree. Please note the date. Four years after Constantine's degree, de decree. Then the Council of Laodicea. An ecclesiastical council. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath. But must work on that day. I hate the word must, don't you, when it comes to religious belief? Do you want to be told you must stop work on Sunday and you must not keep the Sabbath on the seventh day? Would you like that? Here is this church council of Laodicea laying down the law, dictating on how you treat Sunday and how you treat Saturday. And then it says, if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. Anathema means to be cut off from God, cut off from Christ. The worst judgment of God, may that come upon you, that's what anathema means, if you Judaize. Charming, isn't it? Have you noticed so far how many laws we've looked at and how many pieces of legislation we've looked at? And it's all to do with Sunday. Nothing about not killing people or not coveting or not making idols. There's nothing about that. It's all about this Sabbath Sunday stuff. Edict, decree, laws, legislation, papal decrees, church councils. Over a day? The date, 363 AD. 
Here comes another decree. This time Pope Innocent I. No religious assemblies on Saturday. Sabbath keeping, friends, was still observed in Constantinople, but not in Rome. Can you see what's happening here? There's a sort of a there's a lot of laws and rules coming in all about a day. Doesn't make sense, does it? It's just kind of a bit over the top, isn't it? Yeah? 405 AD. We have to conclude from this that the Seventh-day Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the Church of Rome to avoid anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath Roman legislation for political, social, military and religious reasons. You could throw pagan reasons in there as well. Come with me please to page 1325, Matthew 15. Jesus speaking, verse 7, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about, prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, they honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the what? The commandments of men. If you teach as truth, as church doctrine, the commandments of men, you are worshipping Jesus Christ in vain. I didn't say it, Jesus says it. Don't worship the commandments of men. Don't teach the commandments of men. Particularly when they overturn what God has written with his own finger. I mean it's not, a, it's not exactly rocket science is it? You don't trample on God's law and then bring your own stuff in and teach that as truth. Don't do it says Jesus. The mouth says hallelujah. But the heart is rotten. We're worshipping man-made laws. The reward is still out there. Has anyone got these Bible texts for me, please? Please give me the Bible texts that command a change from Seventh-day Sabbath to Sunday. The first group this afternoon didn't have any. I hear the sound of silence. Maybe you need more time. You're welcome to it. But most Christians would tell you, well, there's no way that we worship on Sunday because of sun worship. It's got nothing to do with them. They would deny it and say, it's got nothing to do with sun worship. They will tell you, Sunday is in honour of the resurrection, am I right? That's the reason. Okay, let's run with that for a moment. I want you to meet a friend of mine, <coughs> Dr. Samuel Bakayoki. We're not related, but we could be, I guess. I wish I had his brains. This man is a Seventh-day Adventist. He did something that no one else has ever done and I don't think it will ever be repeated. He applied to the most prestigious university in Rome, the Pontificia Universitas Gregoriana, the Pontifical University of Gregoriana, the most elitist, top of the tree academic institution of the Catholic system in the world. As a Seventh-day Adventist, he went in there and he applied to do a doctoral thesis and they accepted him. Amazing. He got in. The first non-Catholic to get in. And an Adventist? That's quite a story. Let's follow it through. He was walking through the hallway of the Gregoriana, yeah? Gregoriana. <laughs> It's hard to say. This is the hallway, it's not the classroom. And he's walking there in 1969 and he noticed in the distance a manuscript had just been published and it was on display right there. And so being a doctoral student, it was a doctoral dissertation that had been published, he went up to it and was amazed to discover that the writer, a Jesuit by the name of Mosner, had written a doctoral thesis on a topic dear to his heart, the history of Sunday from the beginning to the fifth century. And in that document, Bakioki noticed on page 53 that the writer says, we can conclude with certainty, 
that Sunday was born in the primitive community of Jerusalem to honour the resurrection. Here is a Jesuit scholar. It's a PhD dissertation. It's in the most prestigious university in Rome. And he concludes after all this analysis that we can conclude with certainty Sunday was born in Jerusalem, in the primitive community of Jerusalem, to honour the resurrection. Plain English. Now Dr. Bakayoki, being a student of this university, had certain library privileges. Do you want to see the library? That's the Vatican Library. Now that's the corridor. That's the corridor. And the book stacks are off to the left and the right. And so Bakayoki had unique access to Vatican documents that you and I would never see in a lifetime. And while digging around in there, he found this. A rare document that probably no one in this room would have seen or heard about in your lifetime. He found a document written by Epiphanius, Epiphanius a Palestinian historian who specialised, that's what he must have looked like, who specialised in the history of the direct descendants of the Jerusalem church. What you're looking at now is the most important piece of document I'm showing you in this series. If you're asleep, now's the time to wake up. <laughs> now's the time to wake up, folks. This is dynamite. This is historian <clears throat> specialised in the history of the direct descendants of the Jerusalem church. And before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, these faithful Christians, notice, notice the date, it's well after the cross, it's well after the resurrection, these faithful Christians fled Jerusalem to avoid the destruction that would come upon them if they'd stayed. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place where it ought not to be, flee! Get out! They did. They took Christ's warning and they got out. And they travelled north to a city called Pella, 70 miles north of Jerusalem. They got out in the nick of time. These are the descendants, direct descendants of that early Christian church in Jerusalem. If they were Sunday keepers in honour of the resurrection, they would be doing it because they would have witnessed the resurrection or they would have heard about the resurrection from the apostles. But instead, Epiphanius writes that these people kept the seventh day Sabbath. There it is until his own time of 350 AD. Not a word about the resurrection. The early Jerusalem church fleeing Rome, fleeing Jerusalem went north and kept the seventh day Sabbath going until the time of Epiphanius. Not a word about Sunday. Not a word about the first day of the week. Not a word about the resurrection. My friend Bacchiocchi, being of Italian extraction, very excitedly rushed into his professor's office, Professor Vincenzo Monaca Monachino. He looks like an academic, doesn't he? Too much study makes you weary. I know the feeling. And this professor, who was a Christian gentleman to Dr. Bacchiocchi, said, what is it now, Samuel? Doc, professor, I found the document in the library. What is it? It is dynamite. It shows that the Jerusalem church, the descendants, kept the Sabbath right until 350 AD. He said, show me the document. There it is. And the professor said, this is the death blow to the theory that makes Jerusalem the birthplace of Sunday keeping. That's a huge admission to make. There was no Sunday keeping in honour of the resurrection folks in Jerusalem. Just ain't there. I didn't say it. 
Epiphanius says it. Professor Monachino now admits it, even though it blew his theory sky high. The year is 1971. In a court of law, we call this primary evidence, Your Honour. Let me table the primary evidence. It's not a photocopy, it's the original document of, of Epiphanius. It's dated 350 AD. That would be very compelling and very persuasive, I would have thought. The Jerusalem Church, led by the Apostles, the Mother Church of Christianity, the direct descendants of the Jerusalem Church, kept the seventh day Sabbath until at least 350 AD when Epiphanius died. No mention of Sunday. Sunday was alive and well in Rome, but not in Jerusalem where Jesus spent a lot of his time, where Jesus was raised from the dead. If ever a place was going to have Sunday in honour of the resurrection, it would be Jerusalem. wouldn't be Rome. But the opposite is true. Sunday creeps in in Rome, but not in Jerusalem. There's the document. There's the quote. And the conclusion is the Jerusalem church could not have dropped the Sabbath in favour of Sunday during the time of the Apostles. Impossible! Sabato. Circumcisione. And there is, uh, if you can understand the, uh, the language. Awesome! This is like discovering the Holy Grail. <laughs> and for a Seventh-day Adventist theologian to find this in the Vatican libraries and to be admitted to study there for his PhD is a one in a billion chance of that happening and I don't believe it will ever happen again. I believe God led Bakayoki and opened those doors for him so he could find this document and tell the world. Now many Christians say, well okay, if it wasn't for the resurrection it's because God created light on the first day at creation so therefore Sunday is the first day so it's in honour of light. Isn't it amazing the foxtrot that we have to do as theological dancers to skip around the plain utterances of scripture when it doesn't suit us? Just accept the Bible as it reads and don't come up with the theories and the I think and I think maybe it means this or that. This is nonsense. Here's the proof folks that Jesus Christ was portrayed as a sun god. even as late as 240 AD. Here's the proof. In 1953 they had a dig under St Peter's Basilica in Rome and they found a mosaic on the floor where Jesus Christ is portrayed as a sun god. The first pictorial representation of Christ and he's portrayed as the God of the sun. So don't say to me that oh, the sun worship was a pagan thing and it fell away very quickly. It was still there as late as 240 AD. To reduce the son of God, S-O-N, to a sun God, what's that? Blasphemy. Now, Herb, you're getting too excited. You're jumping the gun. How do I know that this is Jesus Christ? Come with me to the New Catholic Encyclopedia under the heading Christmas and it says in that encyclopedia from the beginning of the third century Son of Justice, S-U-N, appeared as the title for Christ. This amalgam of pagan sun worship and the Son of God had already occurred. This will all be in the notes. Then we go to the throne of St Peter and we are confronted with a massive sunburst. That's not Big Ben's clock face that's been transported from London. That is a sunburst. And I've just done this using computer technology. You've been to the Vatican? You've seen the lots of round symbols, lots of things associated with the sun. 
We call it a halo. It's really a sun, a symbol of the sun. This is called an ostensorium. It's used during the mass for the elevation of the host. Where does that come from? From the solar monstrance, which is an ancient tool for sun worship. I had a Catholic lady here this afternoon. Tears in her eyes said to me, I am absolutely floored by what you've shown me. Everything you've said is true. This is called a solar monstrance and an ostensorium. It's connected with the sun, she never knew. Is that a coincidence? The wafer, round, why isn't it a normal square biscuit shape? Could it be? The dome and the hole at the top, could that be? And the solar wheel, could that be? And the dome? I'm not into conspiracy theories and I'm not into looking at shadows and I don't think that this is pure coincidence. The history is too strong. So let's see what the Catholic Church says. Now that I've presented one side, what's their side to the story? Their side to the story is this. In a catechism, in, sorry, in a Catholic Christian, the Catholic Christian Instructed, which is a magazine in 1853, this appeared on page 209, what are the days which the church commands to be kept holy? Catholic Church says Sunday, which we observe by apostolical tradition instead of the Sabbath. Okay. What warrant have you for keeping the Sunday preferable to the ancient Sabbath, which was Saturday? Answer, we have for it the what? What's the reason? The authority of the Catholic Church. We're not just talking about days, folks. It's not about seventh day, sixth day, second day, first day. I know we've trivialised it down to that level in our society. Oh, those Adventists, they go to church on the seventh day when everyone goes to church on the first day. Yes, I know the conversations are reduced to that sort of silly simplicity. This is not about days. This is about authority. The authority behind the day. We read on. Things Catholics are asked about. 1927, page 136, the Roman Catholic Church instituted by God's authority, Sunday as the day of worship, this same church by the same divine authority also taught the doctrine of purgatory. We therefore have the same authority for purgatory that we have for Sunday. You don't believe in purgatory? Because it's not in the Bible. But you believe in Sunday. It's the same authority that backs both. Sunday, according to the American Catholic Quarterly Review, 1883, is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. There's nothing secret here. It's all out in the open. No one's hiding under bed covers. It's all out in the open. The Catholic Universe Bulletin said in 1942, the Protestant who claims that the Bible is the only rule of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Thank you. Then in 1900 this statement came out. Since Protestants deny the authority of the Catholic Church, on what grounds can they base their faith of keeping Sunday? The Seventh-day Adventists unquestionably have them by the hip in this practice. Bit of taunting going on, yeah? Bit of taunting and teasing? Then uh, James Cardinal Gibbons said, Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can only be defended on Catholic principles. You can't defend it on the Bible. That's why no one's come forward with those texts. The Catholic Church, for over a thousand years before the existence of a Protestant, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Nothing secret here. It's all out in the open. Catholic Record, London, Ontario, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. 
the church is above the Bible. This transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And any Protestant who keeps Sunday acknowledges this. What are we doing as Protestants if we keep Sunday? We're acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church who is above the Bible. Do you get it? I didn't write this statement. I didn't write this. This is 1923. This is not 2,000 years ago. This is recent. Shocking, isn't it? It's not about days, folks. It's about authority. It's about loyalty. Loyalty to the Creator and His commandments or loyalty to the creature and His commandments. And one overrules the other. Of course the Catholic Church claims the change to Sunday was her act, the mark of her ecclesiastical power and her authority in religious matters. All these statements will be in the notes. You can hunt them down yourself. There's no secret. They're easy to find. 1950, before I was born, the Protestant mind does not seem to understand or realise that in observing Sunday they're accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. It's almost um, having a go at us, isn't it? It's almost teasing us, isn't it? You claim to be a Protestant. You claim the Bible and the Bible only. So why are you observing Sunday? In observing Sunday you're accepting the authority of the Pope. Now this is interesting. There's a bit of sarcasm here. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day. I command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. We're nearly through. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become what? Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. I don't want you to become a Seventh-day Adventist. These meetings are not about you becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not into proselytizing. I'm a preacher of Bible truth. I will turn on the lights to get rid of the darkness and leave it to the Holy Spirit to press it home to your heart what you do with it. Then you go away and in your quiet moments of devotion this truth presses home on your mind and the Spirit of God convicts you and you make a stand for truth. Then you're going to run around looking for a church to go to where similar opinions and views are held and you'll probably come bounding back here. But I'm not trying to make you a Seventh-day Adventist. I want you to follow Christ all the way. Not 90% and leave a 10% gap there. I want you to come all the way to the foot of the cross and look up to the cross. Not look at it. Come right up close to the foot of the cross and follow him all the way. And don't worship him in vain by following the commandments of men. This gentleman must have had a bad egg for breakfast. This is this year, you know, February this year. Archbishop Jose Cardoso Sobrino from Brazil. A very sad case of a young girl who'd been raped and pregnant with twin, twins. And the medical authorities, everyone decided the safest course for her from a medical viewpoint was an abortion. And of course this man went ballistic. And this is what he said. God's law is above any human law. I agree with that. So when a human law is contrary to God's law, this human law has no value. Now this suits him when it comes to abortion, but it doesn't suit him when it comes to messing around with God's law. Do you see the contradiction? If we were to apply that to abortion, I can understand the principle he's standing for. If I were to apply that to the changing of the Sabbath, he's contradicting himself. Let's take God's law. This is how it reads. Let's take the Catholic Ten Commandments. This is how it reads. 
the commandment to do with images has been removed, so we have a gap. And commandment three becomes commandment two, and they leave out the seventh day completely. It's just remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No mention of seventh day. So we've got a gap, and we've got whole words just left out. Okay? Then we move to the second part of the commandments and the Catholic commandments because they've left out the one dealing with images are one commandment short so they take the tenth commandment and they split it into two. Not to covet your neighbour's wife, commandment nine, and don't covet your neighbour's goods, commandment ten. Has the law been changed? Is it a substantial change? Image worship and Sabbath and no mention of Seventh Day. Okay? Now, these are big issues and I hope you're all big enough and mature enough as Australians to see that this is not about days. This is about worship and authority. This is about who you give your loyalty to. Do you give it to man? an ecclesiastical system, or do you give your loyalty to God? That's what this is about. This is the big issue. One is idolatry, the other one is worshipping the, uh, the Creator. One is worshipping the creature, one is worshipping the Creator. That's what this is about. Now my friend Bakioki, Pope John Paul VI, awarded him the summa cum laude. Is that correct? Yes, we have Italian speakers here. I've been given the nod. Summa cum laude. In Latin it means with highest praise Dr. Bakayoki was given his PhD credentials and a summa cum laude means it's very rarely given and the Pope gave it to him and it's awarded usually to the top 1% of the students. And he even gave Bakayoki a gold medal. Bakayoki was very proud of his medal. And he called this the front side and the back side. And I said, Samuel, that's not good English. We say the reverse. <laughs> Don't call it the back side. <laughs> but he was very proud of his medal. Adventist enters this unique establishment, the first ever, finds this document from Epiphanius that settles the debate for once and for all and is awarded a gold medal by the Pope. That's an unbelievable story, isn't it? I don't think it's going to happen again for quite a while because he published his book, his dissertation from Sabbath to Sunday, which traces the historical origins of Sunday in excruciating detail and it even carries the Pontifical Gregorian University Press logo. That's amazing. Now you can order this off my website. Don't order it through me. My website will bounce you to the Bakayoki family's website and you can order it direct through them. So when you click on this icon on my website under questions, I think it is. Yeah, it's under questions on my website. Click on the orangey book icon and it will skyrocket you across to the Bakayoki family's website where you can place your order and you'll have it within a week together with all the other books he's written about the Sabbath. All the arguments against it, all the latest developments surrounding Sunday in our society, laws that are coming in. Very interesting. Now we come to our own day, 1998. Pope John Paul before he died, issued Deus Domini, the day of the Lord, an encyclical letter. When a pope issues an encyclical letter, people sit up and take notice. And here he promotes Sunday as the Bible Sabbath. There is no more talk about, oh, we changed it from the Sabbath to Sunday. That's old Catholic theology. It hasn't really got them anywhere. It's just created a, a lot of debate. Now the popes are saying, Sunday is the Bible Sabbath. It's a new approach. You can get this on the internet, it's for free, have a read. 
1998, this is what he says. Please follow. Sunday is the day of rest because it is the day God blessed, blessed by God and made holy by him. Is that correct? Hello? The Pope is saying Sunday was blessed by God and made holy by him. What does the Bible say? It says the opposite. Seventh day was blessed by God and he hallowed it. What does Genesis say? God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. It's a complete contradiction of scripture. But the church of Rome is above scripture and tradition has more authority than the Bible. Makes it very hard, doesn't it? And he says Sunday is the day of rest because it's the day blessed by God. And in commemorating the day of Christ's resurrection, not just once a year, but every Sunday, the church seeks to indicate to every generation the true fulcrum of history. It's got nothing to do with Christ's resurrection. I've just shown you the document. That was discovered in 1971 in the Vatican Library. Nothing to do with the resurrection. And yet this is still being pumped out. I'd like a bit of honesty, please. Wouldn't you? Jerusalem Church, led by the Apostles, the Mother Church of Christianity, kept the Seventh-day Sabbath till 350 AD. We saw the document. No mention of resurrection. No mention of Sunday. No mention of the first day of the week. Nothing to do with Christ's resurrection. Then this scary bit comes in where the Pope says Christians should strive to ensure that civil legislation will respect your duty to keep Sunday holy. Now he's appealing to civil law to enforce Sunday. Hello, we're on dangerous ground. You don't need civil law to tell you what day to worship God on. You need the Holy Spirit. Yes? And once we start resorting to law to compel people to worship, we have completely lost the plot. You do not fill empty cathedrals in Europe. And they are empty. You do not build up the attendance of mass in Europe by bringing in a law. The reason why the cathedrals in Europe are empty is because thinking people know that Sunday has no biblical basis and no law is going to change their mind. Croatia, 1st of January this year, Eight months ago, you know what happened? President Message, shaking hands with Benedict, agrees after years of lobbying by the Vatican to bring in Sunday laws into Croatia. Yes, it's a strong Catholic country. We know that. But because the cathedrals were empty, people were in the shopping malls when they should have been at Mass, now the Croatian government has caved in and said, all right, we'll close the shopping malls on Sunday so people can go to church. Are they going to church? No.